Jonathan, do me a favor. Um, did we push the green button on church streaming on the website? You can feel free to go ahead and let them see your face there. He's a near graduate of college. Right? He's finished his, his he's finished his senior project. Yep, thank you. You can do that. Applaud for him. And uh, he's a uh, he's getting ready to we don't know when he's gonna graduate because we don't know what the university is gonna do as far as um, accomplishing that. That's so um, And if you are watching online, then, then you already are seeing this. But if you're not, we're needing to double check to make sure that we have the church streaming prepared. I'm not sure what she, well, it is. <laughs> oh boy. You get to come to the microphone and then you get to talk, Jonathan. <laughs> we are on. And, and you can see us doing this right now. Oh, very cool. <laughs> then, then we'll not. We'll not worry about that then. Good. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a good thing. That's what we thought. We would hope that we were on. However, uh, I knew that I hadn't started the web page. And the web page is an important little piece. An important little piece of us streaming online. What's really funny is the last few weeks we were having some major challenges with getting on Facebook. Last Sunday, out here with people out here, it went on without a problem. So obviously we're on right now. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for checking that out. We're in the final chapter and the final lesson on this incredible man of God, Daniel, prophet also known as Balthazar, uh, given a, a name that was a name after a god of, of Nebuchadnezzar's. And all throughout Daniel's life, from this young teenage boy taken into exile that goes off to, to Babylon, Daniel has been a man of prayer. His prayers have been so powerful that it rescued him from the lions. His prayers made a difference for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His prayers have given him the ability to hear from God through multiple dreams. Nebuchadnezzar was blessed by him and, and learned about the blessings. Daniel has learned about prophecies, about a, the, a history of kings that is going to come and go over a 490-year period of time. Daniel's actually going to come up with the very time that Jesus is going to come down into Jerusalem for that final Passover and to go to the cross. Daniel is blessed with all this information because he spends time in prayer. And I just got to remind you that Daniel didn't just talk when he prayed. He would not have heard the prophecies. He would have not, not gotten all the information if he simply came in and said, God, I want to know what's going to happen in the future. In the name of God, amen, and then walked away. But he had to stop and listen. Daniel actually has insights into when Christ is coming again. In fact, that's our question for this morning. When is Jesus coming back? When is he going to return here on earth? And with some of the things that have been happening, some of us have been wondering, is this the time he's coming back? Is this the precursor for the return of Christ? There are so many things that are in place today. There are a few things missing, but there is so much in place today. Even if this was simply a practice for the Antichrist to unite the world altogether under one thing, 
and to become and come as a savior for the world, would he use something like a pandemic like this? Christ is going to come back, and he very well could come back quite soon. So in Daniel chapter 12, we're going to try to understand when Jesus is coming back. And I'm going to tell you when he's coming back. Are you ready for that? <laughs> okay, some yeah. of you are already like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah sure, Bill. <laughs> Our text for this morning comes from Daniel 12, verses 5 through 13. And I'll just start out with um, verse 5 and go through 7. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before the waters, before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time, times, and half a time. There you go. That's when he's coming back. Got it? That's your answer. Jesus is coming back. In fact, the Son of Man, as he's described, who could that possibly be? Couldn't that possibly be Jesus? If not Jesus, clearly a very important angel who's hovering there over the river Tigris, two angels on either side of the river, and Daniel is seeing all this. In fact, look at Daniel 8, 19. He said, and this is an angel, the same angel that speaks to Daniel a couple times, Gabriel, he says, I am going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. Daniel, I'm going to let you know about the end of time. What's going to happen when the Messiah comes back? Or chapter 10, verse 14. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. I'm getting you ready, Daniel, to see what's going to happen at the end of time. It's something clear in the future. Daniel's seeing this vision. He's been probably transported, because it doesn't say that he went to, uh, went to the Tigers and Euphrates. He's been transported there somehow in this vision, and he's seen these two angels that have been talking to him. Remember, we've been carrying this uh, vision on for about three chapters now, right? Started in chapter 10, then 11, and now into chapter 12. And, and Daniel sees this man standing over the, over the river Tigris. And one of the angels, now did he do this for Daniel? We don't know. But one of the angels said, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? And verse 7 says, The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left. Can everybody do that? If you, your shoulders will handle it. Raise both hands. There you go. Yep, there you go. He lifted both hands. Not just one hand, but he lifted both hands. And he swears. Now notice, and when he's swearing, this is something really different. This is not, you know, oh no, he's cussing or something like that. He's saying, God, you're God. He's declaring this great statement. He's worshiping God with his hands. Okay, you can put your hands down. He held them up longer, though, just going to let you know. And he's got these hands up. He says, I heard him swear by him who lives forever and ever. Now, what does he swear? It will be for a time, times, and half a time. And he's declaring what God has been revealing when the Messiah is going to come back. Time, times, and half a time. If you've been with us in this series, if you've read Revelation, you know you've heard that phrase more than once, haven't you? Revelation 12, 6. The woman, this is the woman who's actually a, an image of the one who's giving birth to the Messiah. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Remember? That in the Hebrew calendar, a month was exactly 30 days long. So we didn't have a 28-day month and a 31-day. We had 30-day months. And so 1,260 days. Somebody calculate how many months and years that might have been. Think if you uh, figure it out, it's three and one-half years. Time, that'd be one year. Times, that's two years. And half the time, 
That takes you to three and a half years or 1260 days. Revelation 12, 14 goes on. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for what? I guess your maths are making it too hard for me to hear. Time, times, and half a time. And where she would be taken care of for that time, out of the serpent's reach. Who's the serpent? Satan. Daniel 7, 25. He will speak against the Most High. He's now speaking about the Antichrist, or that, that prince that is the, the small horn that comes out of several other horns. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The Antichrist is actually going to try to change times, thinking that he's in control of the times. He's going to do this. And, if, and he goes on and says, The holy people will be delivered into his hand for what? A time, times, and half a time. The man, or Jesus, is responding. I'm going to let you know that if you calculate this out, you're going to understand exactly when Christ is going to come back. Now there's an interesting little piece there that you may have heard when it warned about the horn and what it was going to do to the people of God. In fact, when the Antichrist comes, he will have a vengeance to fight both Israel and Christians, the people of God. We have to understand that God's people will be broken. The end of time, God's people will be broken down and they will experience deliverance when they are weakest. Revelation and Daniel both warn about if you're alive at that time, how terrible it's going to be. And you're going to want to run and flee. And then he also says that there's going to be this place of refuge that's going to be given to God's people. And he's going to be specifically speaking about the Jewish people who he is going to give one more opportunity there after the tribulation's already started to come back and to receive the Messiah as their Lord. I want you to think about what God has done for people when they were weak. God came to Abram, Abraham, when he and his wife were old and couldn't bear any children. Weak. And gave them a son. The children of Israel left Egypt, leaving bondage. And they headed out to the Red Sea. And when they got there, they couldn't cross and... Pharaoh's army was coming and pressing on them, and there was no way they could save themselves. They are weak without strength. And God tells Moses, put the rod in the, in the water, and the water will, will open, and they will cross over on dry ground, and Pharaoh's soldiers will all drown in that same water once it comes back over them. The story of what God did for the children of Israel shows how God works with people when they are weak. They're out there complaining in the middle of the desert. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to drink. And God gives them food. And God gives them water. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God ministers to us when we are weakest. Paul said, when I am weak, that's when I am strong. As Daniel's looking at this vision and seeing what's going on, he says, I don't understand. And so he asks in verse 8, I heard... But I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed, 
until the end of time. Daniel, you've been given everything you need to know. It's all now going to be sealed up in a scroll until it's time for that scroll to be opened. By the way, you remember the portion in Revelation where it says, John says, and I saw this angel come down with a scroll and no one was worthy to open the scroll. And there was silence in heaven. And he says, I, I fell down and I started to cry because there was nobody worthy to open up this scroll. And then an angel said, touched him and said, but look, behold, the Lamb of God comes across, which is Jesus, and he opens up that final scroll. Daniel, I know you don't understand, but in the last days, you will see and know. In fact, Deuteronomy even speaks of this end time in chapter 4, verse 30, which says, when you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. Even Moses is prophesying what's going to happen at the end of time as God's people will have an opportunity to come back to him. Go on in verse 31 of chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. Jesus has formed a new covenant, true? A brand new covenant. Paid for with the blood of the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God. But the old covenant, the old covenant is still the one guiding the Jewish people. And God says, I'm not going to forget you. So when it comes to the end of time, finally, in that day, I'm going to come. I'm going to be merciful to you. In fact, listen to what Zechariah 13 says. Verse 8. In the whole land, declares the Lord. Two-thirds will be struck down and perish. What did it say? The Antichrist is going to fight against God's people, the Israelites. He's going to actually destroy. It says two-thirds of them, and one-third will be left in it. This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. Watch for the time that the Jews come to Christ at the end of time. And by the way, watch for the temple to be built. And then watch for the sacrifices to take place in the temple yard. And may, may it actually be the, the Antichrist himself who brings about this worldwide peace that will cause the Islam Muslims to say it's okay to put something else on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount, if you've ever been there, is controlled by the Muslims right now, not by the Jews. It's controlled by Islam. There's the mosque that's up there, the Al Akbar Mosque. There's the Dome of the Rock, which is where they believe that Ishmael was going to be sacrificed. You see, they have the story just a little bit different. They believe that Ishmael was going to be sacrificed by Abraham, not Isaac. They believe it's a sacred place, and because of that, it's a place that is very dangerous. However, the Antichrist will cause the Muslims to say, it's okay, we're at peace, rebuild the temple up there. It will be that kind of power that the Antichrist will have. And Israel will worship again there, and perform sacrifices again. But notice, then the Antichrist will turn on them and send them away, and it will be terrible for them. Two-thirds of them will perish, but one-third will be left, and that third, as through fire, will be tested like gold. And they will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say they are my people. The Lord is our God. Verse 10 of Daniel chapter 12. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined by the witness of by the, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. Such an important phrase here at the beginning of verse 10. When the angel says to Daniel, many will be purified, 
being spotless and refined. And what, what the angel is saying is that there's going to be a time of purification that's going to come, especially at the end of time. Psalm 51 7 says, Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Isaiah pleads with sinful Israel to come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Did you know that, that fire has a, a few different purposes? In our text, it says that many will be refined by fire. Fire destroys. Boy, we've seen that, haven't we, this last week? Um, in cities across this nation where uh, looters went in and then set things ablaze. Fires destroyed huge pieces, millions of dollars worth of property. But it doesn't just destroy. Fire also purifies. You use fire to purify gold and silver and other metals to take the dross, to take the dirty stuff off, and to get to the purest of the metal. I couldn't help but thinking this week that fire also distracts. Fire distracted the police so, so, that, um, so that the police would have to go chase fires and protect firefighters so that they couldn't deal with looters, so that then they'd go to another place to loot. So fire has a lot of different purposes, doesn't it? Malachi chapter 3 says, but... Who can endure the day of his coming, the coming of the Lord? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. Malachi says, when the Lord comes, he's going to clean us up. He's going to purify us through fire, and look how he says it, and through the launderer's soap. Isaiah continues, I will turn my hand against you. I will thoroughly purge away your dross and remove your impurities. I will restore your leaders as in days of old, your rulers as at the beginning. After your word, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be delivered with justice, her penitent ones with righteousness, but rebels and sinners will both be broken, and those who forsake the Lord will perish. When Christ comes back, he will come as a refining fire and a launderer's soap. So the angel turns to Daniel and he says, don't worry. Daniel, from the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. If you're keeping track, that's 30 days more than the three and a half years, isn't it? The Antichrist comes, there, and then three and a half years after that, after the abomination of desolation is set there in the temple, after Jesus then comes, to destroy Satan, what's he going to do? He's going to have to take some time to judge Satan. He's going to take some time to judge God's people and all the people. And, and that's what we believe is happening during this 30 days. And then he's going to say later, 1335, which is another 45 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days, because that's when you're in heaven. That's when it's all finished. It's all done. Daniel 12, 13 says, As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest. Then at the end of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Well, as we're wrapping up Daniel, I also think of what Peter said. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your Hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Jesus is coming again. And if you are alert and staying close to Christ, then you will know 
when Christ comes back. Father, my, we're in a world that is so full of sin. And we need not just your forgiveness, we need your cleansing, we need your refinement. We need you to purify us. We need you to change us. Begin that with your church, Lord. And let it spread across this land even more than the virus has spread. Let your love and your truth and your forgiveness and your cleansing spread across this land until you come again. And Lord, you told Daniel, okay, Daniel, now go and rest. You can relax, Daniel, because I'll wake you up at the end of time when I come back. And Lord God, you've promised to do that for all of us who say yes to you, Jesus, who believe in you. And I pray that everyone listening will take that step and not be afraid of your refining fire to cleanse our sins. Have your way in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <music> you.